It's February 3, 2020, and this is the Paperback Warrior Podcast. We're back for the attack. It's another episode of the Paperback Warrior Podcast. We're so happy to be here with you. Glad that you're uh, listening to our show. Again, our flagship site is paperbackwarrior.com. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can always email us at paperbackwarrior at yahoo.com. We get a lot of emails, and I apologize to those that have sent emails due to the holidays and just uh, writing for the show and doing a lot of reading. Just haven't had a chance to respond to everyone. But uh, we do take your uh, your comments into consideration when we present episodes for the show, so we always appreciate that. Tom, what's on tap for today? On today's show, I'm going to be doing a feature on the Larry Kent series, and many of you probably don't know much about that series, and there's a good reason why you may be unfamiliar with it, but we intend to fix that today later in the show. You, Eric, are going to be reviewing a book called SCOM Number 1, and I see those all the time in used bookstores, so I'm dying to hear what you think about it. I'm going to give a very brief review of an, event, of an adventure novel named Croc by David Hagberg. But first, I received a request from a listener to do an episode about nonfiction books discussing our genre. And someday I may actually do that, but I thought it might be less cumbersome to do a short periodic segment called Books About Books. And to that extent, Eric, what do you think the best-selling book ever released by Stark House was? I know exactly what it is. <laughs> it's uh, it's Gil Brewer's Flight to Darkness. No, sir. You would be incorrect. What? Uh, although I bet you the Gil Brewer is, uh, books sell well because uh, they keep releasing them. No, actually, their best-selling book, according to the owner of Stark House, is Paperback Confidential, Crime Writers of the Paperback Era by Brian Ritt. It's a, uh, it's a reference book. It's an alphabetic, alphabetic encyclopedia of sorts listing the top crime authors from the 1950s, some 40s, some 60s, and beyond, um, with about a page or two telling who they are and discussing their style and their books. More interestingly, it also has book recommendations for each author. So while the paperback costs like $16 or 7 bucks on Kindle, it's way more expensive than that because as soon as you start reading it, you're going to be intrigued and spend a fortune on the books discussed inside. The books don't contain cover scans of the paperback originals discussed, but they do have black and white photos of each author. So if you're dying to know what Charles Williams looks like, and he was a hunk, uh, you have your answer here. Nice. It's a great reference book for anyone interested in the paperback original era of crime fiction, and uh, I use it a lot in my um, research for the podcast and articles. So again, that's a paperback confidential crime writers of the paperback era by Brian Ritt released on Stark House, available on Kindle and paperback. Why don't I just launch right into it, because uh, this is sort of a complicated uh, series to talk about. It's uh, uh, doing a feature on the Larry Kent series. So, Eric, if I told you there was a hard-boiled men's adventure series that went on for 400 installments that you knew nothing about, would you believe me? No. Okay. Well, this, there, it's true, sir. <laughs> Did you know my? Had you ever heard of the Larry Kent series before uh, I started writing about it for, for the site and we planned this episode? When you mentioned Larry Kent to me. I, I was thinking it was that um, dirty computer game that came out in the early '90s, but then I looked and it was Larry Leisure. So, ah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, leave it to you to go right there. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Larry Kent. Uh, the reason you haven't heard about it is because it was a series from Australia. Uh, he, although the the hero of the story, Larry Kent. Um, was a New Yorker. So it's kind of like Carter Brown in that sense, where Carter Brown was, uh, Alan Yates, the author of the Carter Brown series, was in Australia writing a series about American, in his case, mostly California detectives. The Larry Kent series went on from 1954 to 1974 and was written under the house name of Larry Kent, right? So it's one of those, like Nick Carter, Ellery Queen, where the main character is the house name, right. first person narrated. I don't know why they keep doing, kept doing that. It's like, who are they fooling? Yeah. Right? Anyway, the primary author was actually an American named Don Herring, H-A-R-I-N-G, who settled in, settled in Australia after World War II and died in Honolulu at age 58 in 1981. There was another author who wrote Larry Kent books, uh, an Australian from Queensland, I believe, named Des Dunn, Des Dunn, D-U-N-N. There may have been other authors who were writing under the house name, but records are spotty. It's difficult for me to do research in Australia, being here in Florida. 
Larry Kent series was published by Horowitz Pro- Publications, the same people who brought to you the work of Carter Brown. Uh, like Carter Brown, the books leveraged Australia's fascination with U.S. crime fiction and culture. Uh, and Larry Kent, like I said earlier, is a New Yorker. Even before the books came out, the character of Larry Kent started as a newspaper reporter in 1950 on a popular Australian radio drama called I Hate Crime that ran for 155 30-minute episodes. And so when you take a look at the original Larry Kent paperbacks, you see often it says, I hate crime on the cover. And it's it, it, when I first saw that, I was like, well, that's kind of a weird non sequitur to throw there. Like, I guess Larry Kent hates crime, but yeah. why are they saying that in every book? They're trying to tie it in with this popular radio series. Hmm. The book series began as a series of novellas in a Larry Kent magazine and eventually evolved into standalone paperbacks. The series began as a a bunch of novellas in Larry Kent magazine and eventually evolved into short standalone paperbacks. Uh, Like I said earlier, the paperbacks have I Hate Crime as a tagline on the covers. Kent's character in the written version became a private investigator, clearly influenced by Mickey Spillane's Mike Hammer. The uh, covers look kind of familiar um, and because they, they were painted very salacious covers, and the titles had nothing to do with what was inside the books. Um, the painted covers had like women, the super hot women, just spilling out of their clothing, very similar to the Hank Jansen books of the same era. As time went on, the writers of the Larry Kent series um, of Private Eye novels borrowed a page from Stephen Marlowe's Chester Drum and Michael Avalone's Ed Noon when the hero began accepting espionage assignments from the CIA in selected novels. The numbering of the series is really screwy. They're numbered 1 to 800, but there's only about 400 books. The first 108 installments were novellas, and then the novels begin starting with number 500 and continuing through number 800. I can't find any record of books or stories bridging that gap between 109 and 499. If they exist, someone let me know. Um, I guess the more the merrier. Good news for us and for American readers these, I've never ever seen one of these books in the wild ever, but twenty five of the books are now available as ebooks from Piccadilly Publishing, available on my Kindle and your Kindle. Piccadilly Publishing is owned by Ben Bridges, uh, who's a guy whose real name is David Whitehead, and he preserved the original art for the ebooks. I read two of them to see what the fuss is all about. I want to give you capsule reviews. The first one is called Curves Can Kill. It was written by Don Herring. It was number 642 in the series from 1965. It's got a blue cover and a hot babe with a big rack on it. Uh, The first, so it's a variation on the private eye as spy gambit. Way more violent than even the best, uh, um, and just really good. Uh, Better than the best Carter Brown I've ever read. This was an awesome book, Curves Can Kill. The action opens with Larry Kent being tied to a chair and being tortured by a Romanian goon who's using both fists and a switchblade who wants to know what Larry Kent knows about something called Z-Detail. It's it is brutal and violent opening. Um, it's going to play well for readers of Pulp Fiction who want like something way more extreme than Carter Brown ever would offer. Uh, fortunately, we don't have to sit through 120 pages of Kent being carved up with a switchblade. Um, we find out that Z Detail is like a private intelligence outfit with close ties to the CIA who ends up hiring Kent as a contract operative for the vast sum of $300 a week. He needs to befriend a woman in New York. The, um, it's kind of sexy. It's not graphic in any sexual detail, but it's got a real swinging 60s feel to it toward women. None of this would actually fly today, but that's part of the fun of vintage fiction. Anyway, the women, the woman has a secret uh, that uh, he needs to learn, and it can just kind of go in. I guess my point, Eric, is that this book just really surprised me with the quality of the prose and the story, because I had been misled to believe that the Larry Kent series was just disposable fiction, which had such an aggressive production schedule that it would never be outstanding, and that it would be, it was just kind of disposable pulp fiction. And instead, as I read Curves Can Kill, I found myself just repeatedly muttering, wow, this is really good. If you're a fan of violent spy mysteries with major twists and turns, you're going to love this book, Curves Can Kill. And um, there were some slow sections, but nothing ever boring in this one. It, uh, it, with, it had a bloodbath of a climax. I, I guess when I'm not doing a full review of it here on the show, but I just want to impress upon you guys how good it was and why I decided to read the number 794 in the series – from 1974, nine years later, Hello, Dolly, Goodbye, it's called. 
it was, and I thought it might be interesting because it's a more traditional private eye story. And Eric, it was terrible. Mm. It was so bad. And I had to read the first chapter three times just to understand what was going on. It was so unclear what was happening. As far as I could tell, Larry Kent in this book, Hello, Dolly, Goodbye, was hired by the NYPD to investigate two missing police officers, which makes no sense on its face, right? The NYPD has (laughs) people capable of investigating (laughs) stuff. He's given a short list of names that the two cops were investigating, but it's never really explained what this list of names was in what case they were investigating. It may have had something to do with alien smuggling, but it wasn't clear. The era that the book took place was all mixed up. So the paperback was published in Australia in 1974 and takes place in New York City. But on page one of the book, a character says, quote, The cop is a client. Write down in your client's book, 20th of May, 80. Does this take, book pay, take place in 1980? Does it take place in the future? Everyone in the book <laughs> speaks in, a, in like a 1940s vernacular and wears fedoras. There's a reference to a boxer named Sonny Liston, who was an American boxer who competed from 1953 to 1970. I don't know what to make of any of this. I guess it doesn't really matter. The paperback, the paperback just felt very unstuck in time, in addition to this opaque plot where I never knew what was happening. Now, in its defense, there were some great scenes where Larry Kent gets to kick ass. The hard-boiled P.I. dialogue was really excellent. The plotting was just a disaster. The only thing I could figure is that Larry Kent series was probably winding down by 1974, and Don Herring just was phoning it in to fulfill his contractual obligations because Hello, Dolly, Goodbye is a total mess. I'm not, however, giving up on Larry Kent because I've seen how good the series can be because Curves Can Kill was a masterpiece. Um, so going forward, I'm going to avoid 1970s installments unless I get a solid tip on a particularly good one from that era. Uh, David Whitehead has provided me with a handful of them as, as review copies that I'm going to read um, or, and continue reading and reviewing. Um, I, I, beyond Once I kind of get rid, finish up with the 25 that Piccadilly Press uh, does, I don't know what I'm going to do because I'm, I'm not going to go to Australia or send away and spend a fortune on these things. They're, they're still rather disposable. But um, I was so impressed with that one that I read and so disappointed by the one that was terrible. I don't know which one is Larry Kent. I don't know which one's the real guy. I would say the third book that you're going to read is going to be the, uh, the, the tip of the balancing point. I think so, too. I'm tempted to go the one that I, the Curbs Can Kill. He's working for this private agency, uh, like one of these private intelligence agencies run by rich people. I want to read one of his actual CIA novels, and I think I have a couple of those picked out as well. Nice. Okay. All right. Anyway, so that's Larry Kent uh, series worth checking out. It's an Australian series. Uh, the books are available. Twenty five of the books are available on Amazon. Uh, with Curves Can Kill being the best of the two that I've read. And so why don't we switch gears and you could tell us about SCOM. Okay. So um, I'm going to ask you a question. Lay it on me. In the 1980s, can you remember when Warner Books did their Men of Action line? I do. It, it, what happened, as I recall is uh, they had a hit on their hands with Dirty Harry, the movie. Mm -hmm. And then they spun off and did a Dirty Harry book series, and those were tremendous of of original men's adventure fiction in the Dirty Harry universe starring Harry Callahan. And then Warner Brothers, or Warner Books, felt, wow, we we, started looking at all the money being made by Pinnacle and probably Gold Eagle and said, okay, well, we can do a men of action line of books. And so I think SCOM was one of those titles. And there was another one called CAT, C-A-T, Crisis Aversion mm-hmm. Team, yeah. that went on for two, maybe three books. I reviewed one. It was okay, but it wasn't good. The series was a financial disaster, and they shut down. I guess the good news, though, is Warner's been making a lot of their Men of Action books available on um, as e-books, but I can't imagine they're right. making, making any money. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, but SCOM's from that era, right? Exactly. Yeah. So uh, that's kind of setting the table for uh, uh, for this uh, debut installment uh, of SCOM. So by the early 1970s, I think the team-based combat theme had become a popular market for the men's action adventure paperbacks to explore. The idea, I'm assuming, is probably stemming from all the, the World War II and, and military fiction that ran through the serials and the, and the magazines. And even the comic books. But I think it became increasingly more prevalent after Don Pendleton's second execution installment, which was called Death Squad. I think at that point, everyone kind of jumped on the bandwagon and said, hey, let's run with the Team Commando theme. By the 1980s, this subgenre was huge. We had like SOB, MIA Hunter, 
We had Phoenix Force, Able Team. The list goes on and on and on. So like Tom had mentioned earlier, Warner Brothers launched their Men of Action line of paperbacks. And one of the creations was this obligatory team-based series called S-COM, which is short for Strategic Commandos. The publisher hired freelance writer Robert McCarvey to author all six volumes under the house name of Steve White. The series debut, Terror in Turin, was published in 1981. First off, I don't think Robert McGarvey ever wrote anything else other than these six volumes uh, within the fiction realm. I think he has a lot of books out there about how to write books. And uh, <laughs> with, hopefully with, with he's... Escom being the feather in his cap <laughs> that qualifies him for that? I guess so. Hopefully he's read one of his own books about writing books. This is a... Uh, Escom is a five-member team that's led by... Stone Williams. Oh, please. Uh, he's a Yale graduate who excelled as a soldier in Vietnam. He later inherits his father's lucrative business. So after contemplating a mercenary life, Williams forms ESCOM to fight the good fight internationally. In his, in his spare time, he designs um, computer games that are terrorist, uh, counterterrorism games. So he actually he, he, he does video games. Uh, the team is made up of... What year was this? This is uh, 1981. I was around in 1981. I know what computer games looked like back then. Was he doing like terrorist pong? Yeah, it was like little. I, I could imagine like little stick figures that were oh, like geez. running behind little buildings. Yeah, things so, like sorry that. to interrupt. Please yeah, it's terrible. Continue. Uh, so the team is Miles. He's the African American. Uh, he served with Williams and Nam. His specialty is martial arts. We have Leah or Leia. She's Israeli. She's the only female member. She does acrobats and she throws. Chinese throwing stars. Lucky, he's the Cuban defector, and his specialty is explosives. And you have Rod, who's the Australian mercenary. He's your big guy. He's the comedic big big dude. So you've got a, a, like a really good force here, including Stone Williams. I mean, this is a this is a, a formidable fighting force. The terror in Turin stems from a terrorist group called the Seventh Mayo Force. Its leader is a dude named Vincent Teresio. Uh, he introduces. The author introduces readers to this communist ideology that led to uh, basically the blowing up of this Italian post office. So 7th uh, Mayo Force, led by Vincent Teresio, blows up the post office. Uh, Teresio is partnered with his girlfriend, Gina, and then they go out and they murder Turin's police chief. And then they celebrate by going to the, the grocery store and stealing a bunch of bread and wine. And they go back and, and have like a little a celebratory dinner. But the problem, Tom, is that the Seventh Mayo Force is this guy, Teresio, and his girlfriend, Gina. And guess what? Their entire fighting force is one AK-47 rifle that they've somehow inherited from some communist guerrilla. They have one rifle. They have a box of ammo. They stole dynamite from a construction site to blow up the post office. The Seventh Mayo Force is a 18-year-old kid, Vincent Teresio. There, some, some force, huh? There's nothing else. So you have this five-member team of ESCOM that gets assigned to go fight the 7th Mayo Force. It's literally like bringing a bulldozer in to plant a, a daffodil. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Overkill. Think about how easy it would be for the author to come up with a, a villain. I mean, he, he can come up with anything. Instead, he chose a pimply-faced teenager. And the kid is, he's a horn dog. All he wants to do is go out and rape people, right? He's got Gina on the side, but he wants to go out and rape these girls. So he ends up kidnapping, uh, I don't know, the police chief's daughter. Or no, no, he, he ends up, I know what it is. He, he ends up uh, kidnapping the daughter of a wealthy Italian auto company uh, founder. And so he, he goes out and, and kidnaps this girl. Anyway, ESCOM gets the call. Stone Williams thinks that this is going to be a great assignment to to test his skills. So they go out after this this Vincent Teresio's Seventh Mayo Force. Dude, there is nothing happening the first 154 pages of this book. Mm. After the blow up of the post office, Teresio literally just hangs out in an abandoned house and fondles Gina and thinks about uh, raping uh, the girl that they kidnapped. 154 pages. Finally, on page 155, Escom arrives. To fight Teresio. There's only 159 pages in the book, Tom. Oh, my heavens. The last four pages are ESCOM fighting uh, Teresio. And they do this by showing up at the house and just shooting. Uh, just, remember, there's a, a, uh, a, a kidnapped 
daughter of a wealthy uh, yeah, millionaire. You want to kill uh, Ferrari's daughter? Or He's she's in the house, and they show up and just start shooting at the house randomly. Somehow they don't kill this girl. Uh, it's a turd. Terror in Turin is a turd. <laughs> <laughs> I would. I'm going to say that this is going into the Hall of Shame. All right, first en- first entry of the year, first entry of the decade. Yeah. Uh, don't waste your time reading this. I know you you've probably seen these in the bookstore. Um, God, this was horrible. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. So that's <laughs> SCOM number one, and it's a real turkey. Who is the author? Who is the author on the cover? Um, the uh, it's uh, it's Robert McGarvey. Robert McGarvey. Don't right. ever read anything Robert McGarvey ever wrote. You have my word. You have my word. All right, so that was SCOM number one. Uh, don't read it. Uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit. Uh, before I get into the review, and I promise there's a method to this madness, have you ever seen this Nick Carter book? I've never seen that Nick Carter book. Okay, it's Nick Carter number 109, Sign of the Prayer Shawl, written by David Hagberg. Take a look at the cover and tell me what's depicted on that cover. This is from 1976. Jeez, it looks like 9-11. Yeah. There's uh, the World Trade Center blowing up with by an airplane. Yes, airplanes <laughs> flying into the World Trade Center in Dude. a <laughs> Nick Carter Killmaster book from 1976, written by David Hagberg. Mm. Brilliant. I mean, it's kind of amazing that like he That's nuts. he made this the plot of a Nick Carter Killmaster novel. I haven't read it. It's probably pretty good. Uh, in fact, I just gave an extra copy as a gift in a Vigilante Santa book exchange I did with some Facebook friends. Nice. David Hagberg, the author of that book, died in on September 8, 2019, at age 76 in Sarasota, Florida. So uh, I want to remember him. Uh, he was a great author, and um, and I'm reviewing a book right now called Croc, C-R-O-C, which is actually written by David Hagberg under the pseudonym of David James. And I suspect James is probably his middle name. Um, he wrote 22 top flight installments in the Nick Carter Killmaster series and six paperback Flash Gordon novels, as well as a bunch of books uh, of his own and with his own name. In 1976, low-end paperback publishing house Belmont Towers released an early career Hagberg thriller called Croc under uh, the David James name. Now, in in the 1970s, the public's imagination was captured by urban legends about kids flushing baby crocodiles down the toilet and the reptiles growing to giant size in the sewers by feasting on rats and other vermin. Hagberg's take on this is um, stars two New York City Division of Sewer Maintenance Workers who handle maintenance and upkeep in the labyrinth of tunnels under the Big Apple streets. In the first chapter, the partners are investigating a cave-in in in an old sewer tunnel where runoff flows into the Hudson River. One of the workers goes beyond the debris pile to further investigate it when he is eaten by a giant reptilian creature while his partner watches in horror from a safe distance. It's actually a very bloody, scary, and violent scene that sets up the action for 211 big font pages to follow. Hagberg trots out a lot of genre tropes in this one. There's the 38-year-old college-educated supervisor who's always riding his worker's ass about this and that. We have a screw-up cop assigned to investigate the missing workers in the sewers. We have the investigative reporter from the New York Post hip deep in the story and sewer water determined to get the full scoop. It's also important to remember that Hagberg wrote Croc during the height of the Jaws craze, and he borrows a lot of the same themes from Jaws, including the bureaucratic skepticism of the threat. Um, and, uh, and it's just a very, very fun reptile-based thriller. Good news is that Hagberg had excellent plotting skills, even in this very early effort. Uh, the paper book has beautiful cover art and, uh, and a great basic premise. And Croc was just a hell of a lot of fun to read. You're not going to want to break off into discussion groups and talk about it or, or launch a podcast to discuss Croc, notwithstanding the fact that that's what we're doing now. But it was never dull or repetitive, and it's totally worth seeking out. Um, if you go into it with the right attitude, you're just going to enjoy the heck out of this book. It uh, takes place in this underground labyrinth of sewers where uh, sewer workers and cops and reporters are battling a giant prehistoric-sized crocodile that has grown to massive size in the sewers and presents a threat to all good people in the sewers everywhere. Tom, growing up in the uh, late 70s and 80s, my favorite subgenre of horror movies is the killer animal genre. There was oh. um, Grizzly. Sure. Uh, Squirm, which was about killer worms. Uh-huh. Orca, which was about a killer whale. Right. There's The Pack, which was about killer dogs. 
Do you ever read Feral? F E R A L. It's about killer cats, like house killer cat. cats. It's basically like like Daphne du Maur, uh heard the birds, but instead of birds, it's cats. I read it when I was like nine. It scared the living heck out of me. And I just found a, a, a used copy and gave it to my son, where it's collecting dust on a shelf. Do you remember uh, Naked Gun? Yeah, sure. Okay, so uh, is it, was it Leslie Nielsen? Was the, uh, yeah, the actor? Leslie Nielsen, yeah. The greatest scene in 80s um, cinema history is in the movie Day of the Animals. Leslie Nielsen is like this uh, park guy, and he fights condors. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. That's so funny. Um, in fact, I, I was going to ask you, the pack, which is about the killer dogs. Yeah, is, I got a copy of that. Yeah, Long Dark Night, I think, or Long Cold Night or something like that yes. by David Fisher. Mm-hmm. Is that in our wheelhouse to, to oh, review? Oh, definitely. I think I think any adventure novel, um, you know, like I think the there's a whole er- area. Uh, yeah, the answer to your question is yes. Okay. One, because we get to make the rules. Two, because it's an adventure <laughs> novel. Is it's it def- an adventure novel? Though? He's, he's just fighting a pack of wild dogs. Yeah, but there's nothing wrong with that. What's okay. the difference between fighting IRA terrorists and a pack of dogs? <laughs> or, 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 or reanimated Nazis or any other stuff we're, uh, we're reading. So we get to make the rules. That's it. I think there's also a subgenre of natural disaster books that I'd like to get yeah. into. You know, the earthquake, hurricane, tornado uh, type books. And, um, and there's just tons and tons of those. I mean, listen, we get to make the rules. It's our podcast, our website. And uh, as long as we don't diverge too much. I mean, if, we, if you decided you wanted to make it a fantasy and science fiction site, we'd have to have an off-air conversation about whether this makes sense for the brand. Okay. But man, as far as action novels where people are battling, uh, battling like swarms of ants or killer funguses and stuff like that, go for it. Okay, I'm going to ask you about two books Uh-oh. that I see you laying over here. Oh, boy. The first is uh, something called Double Trouble that you've got laying over there. Oh, yeah. Let me get off mic for two seconds to lunge across the poker table and grab it. Yeah, what is that? Double Trouble. I thought it was, in, in fact, I think it's um, the, the Chester Drum Shell Scott team up, right? It is not. Oh. Uh, this particular Double Trouble is a um, nonfiction book by someone named Sheldon Jaffery, J A F F E R Y. It's um, it is a biographic chronicle of ace mystery doubles. It basically goes through every single ace double for mysteries. Ace, ace also did doubles for science fiction and for westerns. This doesn't cover those, but it gives a plot synopsis of every one of these mysteries and kind of fun facts about the author. It also helps identify the pseudonyms being used by these authors. I got a lot of ace doubles, and they are of varying quality. And so I always use this book before I actually read one to figure out who the author is and if there's any fun facts. It's still available. It's kind of a print-on-demand thing. It's sort of cheaply made. There's no pictures other than uh, some sort of mediocre cover art. But the um, but man, oh, man, it's a great reference book, and I recommend it highly. It's called Double Trouble by Sheldon Jaffrey. So I was sitting here and looking at your uh, book collection, and there was a really thick book that was sitting in there, which is unusual. And it's also a faucet gold medal, which is even more unusual. They don't put out thick books. This is by an author named A.J. Quinnell. The name of the book is Man on Fire. So my immediate question is, is this the Denzel Washington film that I'm thinking of? Yes. This, yes, it is. It was based on this no- this novel? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's supposed to be a great book. I have not read it. Uh, people who don't read a whole lot of books have read this book and said, wow, it's terrific. And so... Um, the size of it is not it's not intimidating to me but it's going to take me uh, as long as to read two or three books but yeah it's basically it was made into a movie with Denzel Washington that I haven't seen and know nothing about and I don't want to see the movie or know anything about it until I get a chance to read the book but people tell me it's one of the best books okay now I'm really confused so this particular printing came out in 1987 but on the cover it says now a major motion picture was it's it? been made into a movie more than once. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Denzel Washington, uh, the mo- I don't know who was starred in the first movie, but the Denzel Washington movie was a remake of an earlier version of it, of the movie, but the book came first before hmm. any of them. In fact, I think it may be a series where the uh, A.J. Quinnell has other books in the series starring the same dude. I suspect that's the first one, but in any case, I'm positive that one stands alone nicely because people that I work with have read that. They know that I'm into books from that era, and they're like, oh, man, you got to read Man on Fire. It was so good. And, and I always look at them like, I didn't know that they read anything, and, uh, and but they seem to like that book. Yeah, yeah, okay. If you want to tackle it before I do, please be my guest. How are we doing on time? Yeah, i got about two minutes. Uh, I'm, uh, on, I'm out of things to talk about. I, 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 mentioning um, your little story there about people ta- talking to you about books, uh, somebody told me, I guess this was maybe about six months ago, uh, I told them I did Paperback Warrior, and... People always want to bring up like, uh, you know, like John Sanford or, or uh, is that John Sanford? Yeah, John Sanford. He yeah. writes the... Um, or they yeah, bring yeah. up Clive Cussler or somebody sure. that I'm really not interested in. 
But uh, this one said you've got to read uh, Michael Conley's books uh, oh, about uh, some detective. Dan, Dan that, Fortune. Is that what it is? Michael Connell. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, Bosch. Yeah. Harry Bosch. Harry Bosch. That's it. Yeah, yeah. He was a Vietnam tunnel rat and he becomes like a detective or yeah, something. Yeah, no, I read the first one or two. They're good. They're, They're good. good. I, I think they got better over time, actually. Uh, he They've adapted it into an, a very successful and highly regarded Amazon Prime TV show called <gasps> ah, Bosch. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I, I've seen that when I scroll through and I didn't, I didn't put two and two together. Yeah. The TV show is supposed to be great. I think every season covers basically one novel's worth. It's like a continuing story mystery and then the next season's a different one. He's a he's a cop. As I recall, it seemed a little overwrought to me. Like uh, like there was the weight of the world was on this guy's shoulders, oh, yeah, and yeah. Um, and they were you know they're long books and they're contemporary books. And I prefer the hundred and eighty page books from nineteen fifty nine. Uh, but but uh, people love the Bosch books and say they're great. And uh, and he's a terrific author and supposed to be a nice enough guy. So um, if you wanted to take a break from doing what we do to read a Harry Bosch novel, uh, you're probably fine. I. People love the books, and people are, like, rabid for them. Uh, I, like I said, I read the first one and liked it okay. I started the second one. I don't know that I finished it, but that was probably more my fault than the book's fault. So I think that that series started in the late 80s and ran through the early 90s. 80 seems early for that one. I think it's a book of the 20, uh, the 21st century. You think so? I just know I started my job in 1995, and the books were pretty mu- pretty new at that okay. point. And well, so- it'll, still, it'll still fall into my question. Do we still well, would we consider that vintage fiction at this point? You know that's hard to say. Man. <laughs> like books, if I, here we are in twenty twenty, right? I mean, so, that's twenty five years, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, the, so I, I see a book from two thousand. I'm like, oh, that's too new. It's not what I'm interested. <laughs> in. But that book's twenty years old. Yeah, I often think about that when I um when I repost our reviews of um of novels from like nineteen ninety eight. That we may every now and then we'll review something from that era, and I'll read. You know, I'm like, can I repost this in the vintage paperback group on Facebook, or am yeah. I going to get like in trouble with their moderators for doing that? But man, if it was a car, it'd be a classic car at this. Yeah, point. like if if, um, if we're looking at like a Stephen Hunter book from '96, what makes that any different than reading an adventure novel by Chet Cunningham from '92 or '93? It doesn't. Yeah. And, and again, we get to make the rules. Yeah. I just you know, I, I just think if we start covering a lot of the Mitch Rapp books or the um, Jack Reacher books, at some point we got to sit down with each other off air and say, what are we doing here? What are no. we? What's what's our brand as Paperback Warrior? Yeah. Uh, but you know, read what you want. Uh, maybe, maybe it should be paperbacks. Those those books came out in hardback. <laughs> yeah, well, that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're uh, um, yeah. It's but um, I, I don't have any problem with those books or people who enjoy those books. It's just I don't like the size of those books. I think at some point books became artificially inflated to. 400, 500, 600 pages, not because the author needed that many pages to tell a story, but because the publishers knew they could command 1895 for a hardcover that that was that size, and people don't want to pay that for a 180-page book. I really feel strongly that if you can't tell a story in less than 250 pages, um, you know, we, you need to reevaluate your story. I'm like that with um, Stephen King. I love his writing, but I almost have to warn my family, hey, I'm getting ready to start a Stephen King book. And this is going to take a month of reading. Yeah. yeah. No, I, listen, I'm a huge Stephen King fan, and uh, and but I do think his stories can meander quite a bit. And, yeah, I mean, you, you get eight pages of making coffee. Right. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, especially after you read a bunch of these, you know, like 180-page uh, pinnacle books. It's uh, uh, These big books seem like you're... Yeah. You're, it's like weightlifting. Well, speaking of long experiences, we're over time now. Oh, good, good. Well, I'm <laughs> glad we had this filler moments together. And uh, I'm, like I said, I'm always terrified when you give me these pop quiz type questions, but I, I, hopefully we field them okay today. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. And jo- please join us next week for another episode of the Paperback Warrior podcast and visit the website, paperbackwarrior.com in the meantime. Thank you so much. Bye-bye now. We'll turn the page next week. Turn the page. <laughs>